Welcome to our introduction to deep learning with Toyby. Deep learning, also often called machine learning, is a hype word which we hear here in the media all the time. It's nearly as bad as blockchain. It's a solution for everything. Today we'll get a sneak peek into the internals of this mystical black box they are talking about. And Toby will show us why people who know what machine learning really is about have to face palm so often when they read the news. So, please welcome Toby with a big round of applause. All right, good morning and welcome to Introduction to Deep Learning. The title will already tell you what this talk is about. I want to give you an introduction onto how deep learning works, what happens inside this black box. But first of all, who am I? I'm Toyby. It's a German nickname. as It has nothing to do with toys or bees. You might have heard my voice before because I host the Nussschale podcast. There I explain scientific topics in under 10 minutes. I'll have to use a little more time today and you'll also have fancy animations, which hopefully will help. In my day job, I'm a research scientist at an institute for computer vision. I analyze microscopy images of bone marrow blood cells and try to find ways to teach the computer to understand what it sees, namely to differentiate between certain cells or, first of all, find cells in an image, which is a task that is more complex than it might sound like. Let me start with an introduction to deep learning. We all know how to code. We code in a very simple way. We have some input for our computer algorithm. Then we have an algorithm which says, do this, do that, if this, then that. And in that way, we generate some output. This is not how machine learning works. Machine learning assumes you have some input and you also have some output. And what you also have is some statistical model. The statistical model is flexible. It has certain parameters which it can learn from the distribution of inputs and outputs you give it for training. So you basically learn the statistical model to generate the desired output from the, desired, uh, from the given input. Let me give you a really simple example of how this might work. Let's say we have two animals. Oh, well, we have two kinds of animals, unicorns and rabbits. And now we want to find an algorithm that tells us whether this animal we have right now as an input is a rabbit or a unicorn. We can write a simple algorithm to do that, but we can also do it with machine learning. The first thing we need is some input. I choose two features that are able to tell me whether this animal is a rabbit or a unicorn, namely speed and size. We call these features and they describe something about what we want to classify. And the class is in this case our animal. First thing I need is some training data, some input. The input here are just pairs of speed and size. What I also need is information about the desired output. The desired output, of course, being the class, so either unicorn or rabbit. Here denoted by yellow and red axis. So let's try to find a statistical model which we can use to separate this feature space into two halves, one for the rabbits, one for the unicorns. Looking at this, we can actually find a really simple statistical model. And our statistical model in this case is just a straight line. And the learning process is then to find where in this feature space the line should be. Ideally, for example, here right in the middle between the two classes, rabbit and unicorn. Of course, this is an overly simplified example. Real-world applications have feature distributions which look much more like this. So we have a gradient, we don't have a perfect separation between those two classes, and those two classes are definitely not separable by a line. If we look again at some training samples, Training samples are the data points we use for the machine learning process, so to try to find the parameters of our statistical model. If we look at the line again, 
then this will not be able to separate this training set well. We will have a line that has some errors, some unicorns which will be classified as rabbits, some rabbits which will be classified as unicorns. This is what we call underfitting. Our model is just not able to express what we want it to learn. There's the opposite case. The opposite case being we just learn all the training samples by heart. This is if we have a very complex model and just a few training samples to teach the model what it should learn. In this case, we have a perfect separation of unicorns and rabbits, at least for the few data points we have. If we draw another example from the real world, some other data points, they will most likely be wrong. And this is what we call overfitting. The perfect scenario in this case would be something like this, a classifier which is really close to the distribution we have in the real world. And machine learning is tasked with finding this perfect model and its parameters. Let me show you a different kind of model, something you probably all have heard about, neural networks. Neural networks are inspired by the brain, or more precisely, by the neurons in our brain. Neurons are tiny objects, tiny cells in our brain that take some input and generate some output. Sounds familiar, right? We have inputs usually in the form of electrical signals. And if they are strong enough, this neuron will also send out an electrical signal. And this is something we can model in a computer engineering way. So what we do is we take a neuron. The neuron is just a simple mapping from input to output. Input here, just three input nodes. We denote them by I1, I2, and I3. And output denoted by O. And now you will actually see some mathematical equations. There are not many of this, these in this foundation talk. Don't worry, and it's really simple. There's one more thing we need first, though, if we want to map input to output in the way a neuron does, namely the weights. The weights are just some arbitrary numbers for now. Let's call them W1, W2, and W3. So we take those weights, and we multiply them with the input. Input 1 times weight 1, input 2 times weight 2, and so on. And this, this sum just will be our output. Well, not quite. We uh, make it a little bit more complicated. We also use something called an activation function. The activation function is just a mapping from one scalar value to another scalar value, in this case from what we got as an output, the sum, to something that more closely fits what we need. This could, for example, be something binary, where we have all the negative numbers being mapped to zero and all the positive numbers being mapped to one. And then this zero and one can encode something. For example, rabbit or unicorn. So let me give you an example of how we can make the previous example with the rabbits and unicorns work with such a simple neuron. We just use speed, size, and the arbitrarily chosen number 10 as our inputs, and the weights 1, 1, and minus 1. If we look at the equations, then we get for all negative numbers, so speed plus size being less than 10, a 0, and a 1 for all positive numbers being speed plus size larger than 10, greater than 10. This way we again have a separating line between unicorns and rabbits. But again, we have this really simplistic model. We want to become more and more complicated in order to express more complex tasks. So what do we do? We take more neurons. We take our three input values and put them into one neuron, and into a second neuron, and into a third neuron. And we take the output of those three neurons as input for another neuron. We also call this a multilayer perceptron, perceptron just being a different name for a neuron, what we have there. And the whole thing is also called a neural network. So now the question, how do we train this? How do we learn what this network should encode? Well, we want a mapping from input to output, and what we can change are the weights. First, what we do is we take a training sample, some input, put it through the network, get an output. But this might not be the desired output, which we know. So in the binary case, there are four possible cases. 
computed output, expected output, each two values, 0 and 1. The best case would be we want a 0, get a 0, want a 1, or, and get a 1. But there is also the opposite case. In these two cases, we can learn something about our model, namely, in which direction to change the weights. It's a little bit simplified, but in principle, you just raise the weights if you need a higher number as output, and you lower the weights if you need a lower number as output. To tell you how much, we have two terms. First term being the error. So in this case, just the difference between desired and expected output. Also often called a loss function, especially in deep learning and more complex applications. You also have a second term we call the act the learning rate, and the learning rate is what tells us how quickly we should change the weights, how quickly we should adapt the weights. Okay, this is how we learn a model. This is almost everything you need to know. There are mathematical equations that tell you how much to change based on the error and the learning function, and this is the entire learning process. Let's get back to the terminology. We have the input layer. We have the output layer, which somehow encodes our output, either in one value or in several values if we, have a multiple, if we have multiple classes. We also have the hidden layers, which are actually what makes our model deep. What we can change, what we can learn, is the other weights, the parameters of this model. But what we also need to keep in mind is the number of layers, the number of neurons per layer, the learning rate and the activation function. These are called hyperparameters, and they determine how complex our model is, how well it is suited to solve the task at hand. I quite often spoke about solving tasks, so the question is, what can we actually do with neural networks? Mostly classification tasks. For example, tell me, is this animal a rabbit or a unicorn? Is this text message spam or legitimate? Is this patient healthy or ill? Is this image a picture of a cat or a dog? We already saw for the animal that we need something called features, which somehow encodes information about what we want to classify, something we can use as input for the neural network, some kind of number that is meaningful. So for the animal, it could be speed, size, or something like color. Color, of course, being more complex again, because we have, for example, RGB, so three values. And text message being a more complex case, again, because we somehow need to encode the sender and whether the sender is legitimate. Same for the recipient or the number of hyperlinks or where the hyperlinks refer to or the, uh, whether there are certain words present in the text. It gets more and more complicated, even more so for a patient. How do we encode medical history in a proper way for the network to learn? I mean, temperature is simple. It's a scalar value. We just have a number. But how do we encode whether certain symptoms are present? And the image, which is actually what I work with every day, is again quite complex. We have values, we have numbers, but only pixel values, which make it difficult, which are difficult to use as input for a neural network. Why? I'll show you. I'll actually show you with this picture. It's a very famous picture, and everybody uses it in computer vision. They will tell you it's because there is a multitude of different characteristics in this image, shapes, edges, whatever you desire. The truth is it's a crop from the centerfold of the Playboy, and in earlier years, the computer vision engineers was a mostly male audience. Anyway, let's take 5x5 five five pixels. Let's assume this is a 5x5 five five pixel, so a really small image. If we take those 25 pixels and use them as input for our neural network, you already see that we have many connections, many weights, which means a very complex model. Complex model, of course, prone to overfitting. But there are more problems. First being, we have disconnected the pixels from its a pixel from its neighbors. We can't encode information about the neighborhood anymore, and that really sucks. If we just take the whole picture and move it to the left or to the right by just one pixel, the network will see something completely different, even though to us it is exactly the same. But we can solve that with some very clever engineering, something we call a convolutional layer. It is, again, a hidden layer in a neural network, but it does something special. 
it actually is a very simple neuron again, just four input values, one output value. But the four input values look at two by two pixels and encode one output value. And then the same network is shifted to the right, encodes another pixel and another pixel and the next row of pixels. And in this way creates another 2D image. We have preserved information about the neighborhood and we just have a very low number of weights, not the huge number of parameters we saw earlier. We can use this once or twice or several hundred times. And this is actually where we go deep. Deep means we have several layers and having layers that don't need thousands or millions of connections, but only a few. This is what allows us to go really deep. And in this fashion, we can encode an entire ima image in just a few meaningful values. How these values look like and what they encode, this is learned through the learning process. And we can then, for example, use these few values as input for a classification network, the con fully connected network we saw earlier. Or we can do something more clever. We can do the inverse operation and create an image again. For example, the same image, which is then called an autoencoder. Autoencoders are tremendously useful even though they don't appear that way. For example, imagine you want to check whether something has a defect or not, a picture of a fabric or of something. You just train the network with normal pictures. And then if you have a defect picture, the network is not able to reproduce this defect. And so the difference of the reproduced picture and the real picture will show you where errors are, if it works properly. I have to admit that. But we can go even further. Let's say we want to encode something entirely else. Oh, well, let's encode the image the information in the image, but in another representation. For example, let's say we have three classes again, the background class in gray, a class called hat or headwear in blue, and person in green. We can also use this for other applications than just for pictures of humans. For example, we have a picture of a street and want to encode where is a car, where is a pedestrian. Tremendously useful. Or we have an MRI scan of a brain where in the brain is the tumor? Can we somehow learn this? Yes, we can do this with methods like these if they are trained properly. More about that later. Well, we expect something like this to come out, but the truth looks rather like this, especially if it's not properly trained. We have not the real shape we want to get, but something distorted. So here is again where we need to do learning. First, we take a picture, put it through the network, get our output representation. And we have the information about how we want it to look. We again compute some kind of loss value, this time, for example, being the overlap between the shape we get out of the model and the shape we want to have. And we use this error, this loss function, to update the weights of our network. Again, even though it's more complicated here, even though we have more layers, and even though the layers look slightly different, it is the same process all over again as with a binary case. And we need lots of training data. This is something that you'll hear often uh, in connection with deep learning. You need lots of training data to make this work. Images are complex things, and in order to meaningful extract knowledge from them, the network needs to see a multitude of different images. Well, now I already showed you some things we use in network architecture, some sub-networks. The fully convolutional encoder, which takes an image and produces a few meaningful values out of this image. Its counterpart, the fully convolutional decoder, Fully convolutional meaning, by the way, that we only have these convolutional layers with a few parameters that somehow encode spatial information and keep it for the next layers. The decoder takes a few meaningful numbers and reproduces an image, either, either the same image or another representation of the information encoded in the image. We also already saw the fully connected network. Fully connected meaning every neuron is connected to every neuron in the next layer. 
This, of course, can be dangerous because this is where we actually get most of our parameters. If we have a fully connected network, this is where the most parameters will be present because connecting every node to every node, this is just a high number of connections. We can also do other things. For example, something called a pooling layer. A pooling layer being basically the same as one of those convolutional layers, just that we don't have parameters we need to learn. This works without parameters because this neuron just chooses whichever value is the highest and takes that value as output. This is really great for reducing the size of your image and also getting rid of information that might not be that important. We can also do some clever techniques like adding a dropout layer. A dropout layer just being a normal layer in a neural network where we remove some connections. In one training step, these connections. In the next training step, some other connections. This way, we teach, teach the other connections to become more resilient against errors. I would like to start with something I call the model show now and show you some models and how we train those models. And I will start with a fully convolutional decoder we saw earlier. This thing that takes a number and creates a picture. I would like to take this model, put in some number and get out a picture. A picture of a horse, for example. If I put in a different number, I also want to get a picture of a horse, but of a different horse. So what I want to get is a mapping from some numbers, some features that encode something about the horse picture and get a horse picture out of it. You might see already why this is problematic. It is problematic because we don't have a mapping from feature to horse or from horse to features. So we don't have a truth value we can use to learn how to generate this mapping. Well, Computer vision engineers or deep learning professionals, they're smart and have clever ideas. Let's just assume we have such a network and let's call it a generator. Let's take some numbers, put them into the generator and get some horses. Well, it doesn't work yet. We still have to train it. So there are probably not only horses, but also some very special unicorns among the horses, which might be nice for other applications, but I wanted pictures of horses right now. So I can't train with this data directly. But what I can do is I can create a second network. This network is called a discriminator, and I can give it the input generated from the generator as well as the real data I have, the real horse pictures, and then I can teach the discriminator to distinguish between those. Tell me, it is a real horse or it's not a real horse. And there I know what is the truth, because I either take real horse pictures or fake horse pictures from the generator. So I have a truth value for this discriminator. But in doing this, I also have a truth value for the generator because I want the generator to work against the discriminator. So I can also use the information how well the discriminator does to train the generator to become better in fooling. This is called a generative adversarial network and it can be used to generate pictures of an arbitrary distribution. Let's do this with numbers and I will actually show you the training process. Before I start the video, I'll tell you what I did. I took some handwritten digits. There is a database called MNIST of handwritten digits, so the numbers of 0 to 9. And I took those and used them as training data. I trained a generator in the way I showed you on the previous slide and then I just took some random numbers. I put those random numbers into the network and just stored the image of what came out of the network. And here in the video, you'll see how the network improved with ongoing training. You will see that we start basically with just noisy images. And then after some what we call epochs, so training iterations, the network is able to almost perfectly generate handwritten digits just from noise, which I find truly fascinating. 
Of course, this is an example where it works. It highly depends on your data set and how you train the model, whether it is a success or not. But if it works, you can use it to generate fonts. You can generate characters, 3D objects, pictures of animals, whatever you want, as long as you have training data. Let's go more crazy. Let's take two of those. And let's say we have pictures of horses and pictures of zebras. I want to convert those pictures of horses into pictures of zebras. And I want to convert pictures of zebras into pictures of horses. So I want to have the same picture just with the other animal. But I don't have training data of the same situation just once with a horse and once with a zebra. Doesn't matter. We can train a network that does that for us. Again, we just have a network. We call it the generator. And we have two of those. One that converts horses to zebras, and one that converts zebras to horses. And then we also have two discriminators. Those that tell us real horse, fake horse, real zebra, fake zebra. And then we again need to perform some training. So we need to somehow encode, did it work what we wanted to do? And a very simple way to do this is we take a picture of a horse, put it through the generator that generates a zebra, take this fake picture of a zebra, put it through the generator that generates a picture of a horse, and if this is the same picture as we put in, then our model worked. And if it didn't, we can use that information to update the weights. I just took a random picture from a free library in the internet of a horse and generated a zebra, and it worked remarkably well. I actually didn't even do training. It also doesn't need to be a picture. You can also convert text to images. You describe something in words and generate images. You can age your face or age a cell or make a patient healthy or sick or the image of a patient, not the patient self, unfortunately. You can do style transfer, like take a picture of Van Gogh and apply it to your own picture. Stuff like that. Something else that we can do with neural networks. Let's assume we have a classification network. We have a picture of a toothbrush, and the network tells us, well, this is a toothbrush. Great. But how resilient is this network? Does it really work in every scenario? There's a second ne network we can apply. We call it an adversarial network, and that network is trained to do one thing. Look at the network, look at the picture, and then find the one weak spot in the picture. Just change one pixel slightly so that the network will tell me this toothbrush is an octopus. Works remarkably well. Also works with just changing the picture slightly, so changing all the pix pixels, but just slight minute changes that we don't perceive, but the network, the classification network, is completely thrown off. Well, sounds bad, is bad if you don't consider it, but you can also, for example, use this for training your network and make your network resilient, so there's always an upside and a downside. Something entirely else. Now I'd like to show you something about text a word language model. I want to generate sentences for my podcast. I have a network that gives me a word. And then if I want to somehow get the next work in a sentence, I also need to consider this work. So another network architecture, quite interestingly, just takes the hidden states of the network and uses them as the input for the same network. So that in the next iteration, we still know what we did in the previous step. I tried to train a network that generates podcast episodes for my podcasts. Didn't work. What I learned is I don't have enough training data. I really need to produce more podcast episodes in order to train a model to yeah, do my job for me. And this is a very important, a very crucial point, training data. We need shitloads of training data. And actually, the more complicated our model and our training process becomes, the more training data we need. I started with a supervised case, the really simple case where we really simple, the really simple case where we have a picture and a label that corresponds to that picture, or a representation of that picture showing entirely what I wanted to learn. But we also saw a more complex task where I had two pictures, horses and zebras that are from two different domains but, domains, but with no direct mapping. What can also happen, and actually happens quite a lot, is weak, weakly annotated data. So data that is not precisely annotated. 
where we can't rely on the information we get. Or even more complicated, something called reinforcement learning, where we perform a sequence of actions and then in the end are told, yeah, that was great, which is often not enough information to really perform proper training. But of course, there are also methods for that, as well as there are methods for the unsupervised case, where we don't have annotations, label data, no ground truth at all, just the picture itself. Well, I talked about pictures. I told you that we can learn features and create images from them, and we can use them for classification. And for this, there exist many databases. There are public data sets we can use. Often they refer to, for example, Flickr. They're just hyperlinks, which is also why I didn't show you many pictures right here, because I'm honestly not sure about the copyright in those cases. But there are also challenge data sets where you can just sign up, get some, for example, medical data sets, and then compete against other researchers. And of course, there are those companies that just have lots of data, and those companies also have the means, the capacity to perform intense computations. And those are also often the companies you hear from in terms of innovation for deep learning. Well, this was mostly to tell you that you can process images quite well with deep learning if you have enough training data, if you have a proper training process, and also a little if you know what you're doing. But you can also process text. You can process audio and time series, like prices or stack exchange, stuff like that. You can process almost everything if you make it encodable to a neural network. Sounds like a dream come true, but as I already told you, you need data, a lot of it. I told you about those companies that have lots of data sets and the publicly available data sets, which you can actually use to get started with your own experiments. But that also makes it a little dangerous because deep learning still is a black box to us. I told you what happens inside the black box on a level that teaches you how we learn and how the network is structured, but not really what the network learned. It is for us computer vision engineers really nice that we can visualize the first layers of a neural network and see what is actually encoded in those first layers, what information the network looks at. But you can't really mathematically prove what happens in a network, which is one major downside. And so if you want to use it, the numbers may be really great, but be sure to properly evaluate them. In summary, I call that easy to learn. Everyone, every single one of you can just start with deep learning right away. You don't need to do much work. You don't need to do much learning the model learns for you. But they're hard to master in a way that makes them useful for production use cases, for example. So if you want to use deep learning for something, if you really want to seriously use it, make sure that it really does what you want it to and doesn't learn something else, which also happens. Pretty sure you saw some talks about deep learning fails, which is not what this talk is about. They're quite funny to look at, just make sure that they don't happen to you. If you do that, though, you'll achieve great things with deep learning, I'm sure. And that was Introduction to Deep Learning. Thank you. So, now it's question and answer time. So if you have a question, please line up at the mics. We have in total eight, so it shouldn't be far from you. They are here in the corridors and on the sides. Please line up. For everybody, a question consists of one sentence with the question mark in the end, not three minutes of rambling. And also, if you go to the microphone, speak into the microphone. So really get close to it. Okay. Um, where do we have... Ah, uh, number seven. We start with mic number seven. Um, hello. Hello. Um, my question is, um, uh, you 
How did you um, compute the example for the fonts, uh, the numbers? Uh, I didn't really understand it. Uh, you just said it was made from white noise. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll give you a really brief recap of what I did. Uh, I showed you that we have a model that maps image to some meaningful values, that an image can be encoded in just a few values. What happens here is exactly the other way around. We have some values, just some arbitrary values we actually know nothing about. And we can generate pictures out of those. So I trained this model to just take some random values and show the pictures generated from the model. The training process was this uh, uh, min-max game, as it's called. We have two networks that try to compete against each other. One network trying to distinguish whether a picture it sees is real or one of those fake pictures, and the network that actually generates those pictures. And in training the network that is able to distinguish between those, we can also get information for the training of the network that generates the pictures. So the videos you saw were just animations of what happens during this training process. At first, if we input noise, we get noise. But as the network is able to better and better recreate those images from the data set we used as input, in this case, pictures of handwritten digits, the output also became more lookalike to those numbers, these handwritten digits. Hope that helped. So now we go to the internet. <laughs> Can we get sound for the signal angel, please? It sounded so great. Now we go to the internet. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah. Now we finally are ready to go to the internet. <laughs> uh, Shosh was asking, do you have any recommendations for Google Chrome extensions for the framework or the software? I, of course, am very biased to recommend what I use every day. But I also think that it is a great start. Basically, use Python and use PyTorch. Many people will disagree with me and tell you TensorFlow is better. It might be, in my opinion, not for getting started. And uh, there are also some nice tutorials on the PyTorch website. What you can also do is uh, look at websites like OpenAI, where they have a gym to get you started with some training exercises where you already have data sets. Yeah, basically my recommendation is get used to Python and uh, start with the PyTorch tutorials, see where to go from there. Often there are also some GitHub repositories linked with many examples for already established network architectures like the cycle GAN or the GAN itself, or basically everything else, there will be a repo you can use to get started. OK, we stay with the internet. There are some more questions I heard. Yes. Um, Rubin8 is asking, have you ever come across an example of a neural network that deals with audio instead of images? Me personally, no, at least not directly. I've heard about examples like where you can change the voice to sound like another person, but there's not much I can reliably tell about that. My expertise really is in image processing, I'm sorry. And I think we have time for one more question. We have one at number eight, microphone number eight. Um, um, is uh, the, the current um, face recognition technologies in, uh, for example, iPhone X, is it also a deep learning algorithm or is it something more simple? Do you have any idea about that? As far as I know, yes. That's all I can reliably uh, tell you about that. But uh, it is not only based on images, but also uses other information, I think, distance information encoded with some infrared signals. I don't really know exactly how it works, but um, at least iPhones already have a neural processing, neural network processing engine built in, so a chip dedicated to 
just doing those computations, you saw that many of those things can be parallelized. And this is what those hardware architectures make use of. So I'm pretty confident in saying, yes, they also do it there. How exactly? No clue. OK, I myself have a last completely unrelated question. Did you create the design of the slides yourself? I had some help. <laughs> uh, we have a really great Congress design. And I used that as an inspiration to uh, create those slides, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, because that's a really amazing. I love them. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Toby.